Hello and welcome to the Garage Series. My name is Jeremy Chapman. And I'm Vijay Kumar. So Vijay, today we have a special show in store, which is about why trust Office 365. We're going to answer your questions around data privacy, uptime, security, and IT control. We're going to do this as a tale of two halves. In the first half, we're going to look at how Microsoft manages the service. And we'll catch up with Kevin Allison, one of the general managers running the service for customers here at Microsoft. And in the second half, we're going to look at how you can configure Office 365 for your organization. And we go on location in Madrid to talk to external security experts about Office 365. But first, as is tradition, let's look at today's trivia question. What guarantee does Microsoft offer on the continuity of service with Office 365 in multi-tenant environments? Is it A, the services are always up to date, B, a 99.9% .9 financially backed SLA, or C, message center updates on service of reliability? So stay tuned for the answer at the end of the show. So what's happening behind the scenes with the service? If you think about uh, moving to the cloud service as an organization, you're really changing your mindset as to where all of that data is and how it's managed and the way that data is accessed. So if we think about how that works, you know, traditionally you've got your on-prem environment, which is kind of your walled garden of all of where your services are. You might have your directory service, you might have data, you might have email, all the other things that you have in place. Your SharePoint uh, could be there as well. All those things generally are accessed remotely via things like virtual private networks or VPN or remote connection protocol if you're using email. Now what happens when I move to the cloud is I still have the same types of control over who can access data, but really what we do is we have our cloud layer and there are, instead of all of this on-premises, there are multiple, multiple different tenants that are logically divided from one another inside the cloud and all the same types of services, whether it's the identity provider, your data, your email, or your SharePoint are replicated in that cloud service, but the same types of connectivity rules apply as to how you can connect to the service. So the great thing as part of this is that we have a bunch of scale in terms of Office 365 to add more and more and more things to that, more tenants to that, and do all the hard lifting, heavy lifting for you. So this means that you don't have to invest in your buildings, in your server infrastructure, power, cooling, software updates, operations, et cetera, all of that, that that goes with it. So of course, all this data doesn't actually stay in the cloud. We do have multiple data centers spread across the world. So right now we're in Redmond, Washington. We do have a big data center facility in Washington State in the United States, but also multiple around the US, as well as data centers, hub sites in Europe, and in Asia to have full global coverage with these data centers and more connecting to them. So even if you're outside of, of these areas, you'll have great performance anywhere on the planet to be able to access your email, SharePoint, and other files. Plus, we have a layer of additional services around getting client bits even deployed in a very quick way if you're using streaming through Office 365. So one of the questions that we normally get from customers is, what do we do with customer data? It is really your data. We do not mine or use your data for advertising purposes. That's really not our business model. And as a customer, if you want to leave the service, you get to take the data with you. Right, any, any changes that we make around the service, we give adequate heads up time around that. And also on the client side, we'll give you 12 months to take any new updates for the clients to make sure that you can test for compatibility with line of business apps or other files or other things that you might want to check prior to deploying the new build. That's right, we also have, the, uh, have a thing called Message Center that we recently launched. Message Center is really the hub for all of, all of the communications for new features and updates that come to this service. So we recently published uptime of, uh, of Office 365 services, and in the most recent quarter, we had an uptime of 99.97%, which means that yep. we were, uh, our service was interrupted for less than 13 minutes in an entire month. Right, and we're contractually obligated to provide at least 99.9% which means that at any given month, it's about 43 minutes of allowable downtime. Otherwise, we financially back it and actually uh, pay the customer back in some way in order to maintain that service level. That is correct. So all of this is, is obviously very important, but from a security standpoint, we also have to do a lot of controls in terms of testing the service. So we have a lot of controls around the security of uh, the physical environment, 
But we also, on the software and the architecture side, do things like penetration tests. And we actually caught up with Mark Rasinovich earlier in season one to talk about some of the red teaming and blue teaming exercises that we do to strengthen and harden the service. Hello, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. So you just got back from Costa Rica, I heard. Yeah, I had a fun week down in the sun. Excellent. I've heard that we've also hired an elite team of hackers to try to hack yeah. into the service. Yeah, that's a, a team that I think would be fun to be on. That they, that we've, so we've got a team, that we call them the red team. We do red team exercises where we give them kind of a capture the flag target. We'll say, go see if you can get into the server, go see if you can get into this account. And we start with the initial set of starting conditions. Like you might, they might have to assume they know nothing about the topology of the service and have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Say go, and then they come back in a couple weeks and give us a report on what they did. At the same time, we've got a blue team that is trying to detect them coming into the system. And it's kind of always interesting to see the results of those reports. We find places where we can tighten things up and improve things and put in more monitoring to always improve the security of the service and make sure that we really are implementing what we've designed, actually. So welcome, Kevin, to the garage. Thank you. Glad to be here. So earlier, we heard Mark Rosinovich talk about penetration testing. What else do we do to safeguard data in the cloud? Yeah, great question. Uh, identity management is a big part of that. What we do is we don't pass the, uh, the passwords, we pass tokens. Another part of what we do is threat modeling. We really focus on what are the different threats that exist in the system and how do we combat each of those. We do a lot of encryption at rest. We do encryption in transit. We also use ways to isolate the data and isolate our operations folks in such a way that access is controlled to that environment through some systems like lock, what we call Lockbox. So philosophically, one of the things we hear a lot from customers who manage all these services on premises is, am I giving up control? How, why should I trust Microsoft in terms of running these services for me? So what would you do to talk to those uh, customers who have these business critical services that they're not always willing to relinquish to us? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's probably three things I would talk about. First is reliability. When you think about reliability, reliability is about achieving um, our SLA, but it's also about basically beating our SLA, exceeding our SLA. What we have to do is operate a system that at its worst situation hits the SLA. So it's about driving that and being more focused on getting that availability. Second, it's about accountability. Uh, we are the ones who coded the, the, the software who better to operate it than the people who coded it. And if we have a problem with it, we know what the, f the fix should be, we can deploy that fix. Third is, is our ability to actually uh, deploy fixes, make changes is a lot faster than what you would see in other operators of our software. Why? Because we, again, we wrote it, we're accountable for it, we're uh, more connected to it, and as a result, we can deliver those fixes faster. And we can walk right over to that coder and say, hey, fix your code, and literally within, within hours sometimes, you can get the fix in place. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in Microsoft, we call that DevOps. What that really means is the dev who basically coded it is the operator of that code. We escalate to the person who wrote the code for the fix, and so there's a great accountability to that. Right. So RSLA is service level agreement that is 99.9%. .9%. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that SLA it translates from our perspective in how do we achieve four nines, not just three nines. It's about how do we achieve four nines. One of the concerns that our customers have is regulatory compliance. Yeah. How do we think about regulatory compi compliance yeah. in Office 365? Yeah. So in Office 365, we actually have a dedicated team that's focused on compliance. And what that means is they go across all the markets and they evaluate those markets and say, what are the unique regulations? What are the unique certification requirements? And they delve into that and they build a control set that says this is what we have to operate our system to achieve regulatory compliance in this market. Then they evaluate each of those controls and they say, how do we change Exchange? How do we change SharePoint? How do we change Link? So that when it's operated, when it's delivered, it meets those requirements. Then finally, we bring in independent verifiers to validate that information. Good example um, on how that works is like privacy. Privacy statements and how you got to meet privacy requirements in Europe is very different than how you meet it in the US. Why? Well, in Europe, privacy is about the individual. In the US, privacy is about the individual, but it's also more about the organization and the organization's control. And so we have to meet those conditions in both markets uh, with the same service. And so as a result, we have a team that really does that work and says, how do we meet it here and here 
and how does that change our operations? We actually caught up with uh, some security experts in Madrid. So not only are they aware of kind of all the different IT controls that we have and how they can use that kind of to configure and control their services, but we wanted to get their opinions while we were on location. So let's take a look at that. It depends on trust when it comes to the cloud. I mean, normally when you have your own on-prem resources, your own staff, mm -hmm. then, I mean, the trust is about who you employ. When it comes to the cloud, it's about uh, who you pick, who you choose. And I think one of the big concerns is where, where my data was going to be located. And I think um, acts like Blue Harbor have really kind of cleared that whole thing up. How would you compare maybe a, an average on-premises environment if somebody really wants to get in versus a hosted environment, say from Azure or Office 365, what, what tools are, what, what approaches are they using now? What kind of mitigations are in place there? We have to understand how we operate and administer the legacy environment still today. Mm -hmm. We do manual logons mm -hmm. as admins on our local resources or local workstations. And that's an opportunity for the hacker to break into that workstation mm -hmm. and get access to administrative uh, uh, whatever control, yeah, yeah console. So yeah. in the cloud it's all automated. You have the fabric controller, you can't really, you can't get into those sessions no, easily. No, it's m m much more separated. So to, to, I mean, to, to break those boundaries, it's going to take a lot of right. efforts to do that. Considering that you've got data in the cloud as well, yeah. you can actually, you, I mean, the data is encrypted. So, for example, all your exchange, your exchange emails, I mean, that's all stored in a data center that's bit lockered. So, you know, mm -hmm. you, it's pretty rock solid there. It's hard to keep a legacy environment updated. You have all these different applications and stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, the environment tends to be very heterogeneous. Right. Yeah. So uh, the cloud is way more controlled in that mm. sense. So it's great to hear the external expert opinion on how the services are managed. One of the things that I took away from that is that it's really difficult to be able to hack into something if you can't get machine level access to that server that's actually running the service. So it's hardened just basically by the obfuscation there. Now a lot of people are managing uh, their environments with things like group policy and of course those controls are all still valid. So on the client side we can do things like uh, restrict where data is stored. So we can for example set up group policies that will block users from si saving their data to SkyDrive consumer storage services. So we do have authentication at the file level. With Office 365 and rights management services you can protect information at the file level using 128-bit encryption. Now, if you were to do rights management services on premises, then you'd have to implement multiple servers for redundancy, load balancing, and not to mention uh, software updates, maintenance, and operations that goes with it. Right, that's Let a me, lot of servers to, to deploy and to manage. That's right. Let me show you how we do it in the service. In about five clicks and about th under 30 seconds, we can actually implement rights management services for an entire organization, as you can see here. So after you've actually implemented rights management services in those five clicks, you've basically got now all the things that we showed in the early architectural diagram of the nine or so servers, and it's running, it's, and it's able to be used by uh, people with the office application. So let me show you what that looks like. So here I have a uh, non-disclosure agreement trip report that I want to protect. And the great thing is, is all I have to do as a user is go into the file menu and then when I click Protect Document, you'll see that the uh, Restrict Access Control lights up. And I can see the standard controls here, so I can restrict access to just full-time employees of Contoso. And once I do that, then if I want to send that uh, document out in email, let's say I, I open a new mail inside of Office 365's Outlook uh, web app client, I can then add uh, an external uh, alias, and that will actually trigger me a, a message and a policy tip that say, this is actually going to a recipient outside of my organization. And then when I go to uh, insert that document, I'm going to put the attachment that I just put the rights management on, uh, add that to my email, and then I can send that out uh, to the recipient. The problem is the recipient won't have a Contoso full-time employee status, and so he won't be able to log into that, that rights managed document. Now, Jeremy sent me that document, and let me show you um, as an external user, I open that email and I won't be able to open that document because I don't have the rights to view that document. Even if I downloaded that file to my desktop, I will not be able to open it. 
Right, so I mean, even beyond what we can do here with rights management services and how easy that is to implement and how safe that is to use, we're doing a lot in terms of proactive controls that help users or to save users from themselves. We actually saw this in a previous show where we were giving policy tips for somebody who's trying to send credit card information outside of their organization and they were flagged by that by the Outlook client and uh, transport rules on the exchange side would block that email from being sent. But beyond that, we also have reactive controls in terms of auditing, right? Right. What you referred to there was proactive controls. Reactively, what you can do is you can actually use pre-built policies to ensure compliance without actually impeding a user's productivity. You can use things like e-discovery to actually have uh, internal auditing and compliance. Right, and that will save a ton of time and a ton of money in terms of all the work that you would do to discover all the information that you want, put it in place holds on it in cases where you want to protect the state of the document when you're doing the search. And in beyond all of these controls that we have around security measures and auditing, we also can look at, at any point in time, the service health state with the service health dashboard. So we get a workload by workload view of all of the health in the organization, all of the Office 365 services. Next, we're going to do a show on mobile device security and we also have two more security show specials that are coming up later this season. Right, before we wrap up this show though, let's have a look at today's trivia answer. What guarantee does Microsoft offer on the continuity of service with Office 365 in multi-tenant environments? So of course the correct answer was B. We have to maintain that service level agreement of 99.9%. This means that the service cannot be interrupted for more than 43 minutes in an entire month. So we've covered a lot of ground here with this show. We've hopefully demystified how we run the service and it is very open and transparent as to you know, what Microsoft does to keep that service up and running. And you have a lot of controls, probably more than a lot of people think in terms of managing who can access data and how to really build a control set around everything that you're running through 365. Of course, if you want to learn more about security and compliance in Office 365, you can always visit the Trust Center. And for this information and more, uh, visit us at Microsoft.com garage. We'll see you next time and goodbye for now. Bye for now.